Ann Dunnington. I lived in Fredericksburg. I grew up in Richmond. Um, love Virginia. Had to get out for college. Um, but of course, as it does, Georgia back in. Uh, my dad lives over in Kingsville, so I came out last night, made it nice and easy, uh, quick drive over. It was great until I found his financial prescription, and I was really traumatized a little bit. Um, but uh, we will not get into that. Um, yeah, seriously, for real. Um, so, peony or peony? Peony. So I'm not going to lie. I go back and forth. Depends on who I'm talking to. My Dutch partners, they all say peonies. And then some of the older people that are in my neighborhood that learned it from their grandparents, and they also say peonies. I've got some Canadian people, and they say POV. But peony is what I always grew up with. And that's my fallback, um, but it doesn't really make a difference. Um, yeah. It just doesn't matter. All right, so who is uh, Peony USA? There's me. Uh, there's Dennis, who is the one that I knew for several years before, because um, he would always come over here, and then his brother, Niels. These guys are two generation or third generation peony growers from the Netherlands. So that's me. <laughs> but the funny thing was, is that I saw this the other night. Oh my gosh. We used the same girl two years ago in the same sort of set of pictures. Like, I think these actually, this could be our picture that somebody snagged. Um, but wouldn't it be great? That's, but anyway. Okay, so on the left, we've got Dennis, and then on the right is Niels. Dennis does more of the uh, operational stuff. Uh, Niels is in the field more. Um, both of whom know everything about everything that has to do with paint. They also sell alliums, um, ornamental onions. Um, I'm trying to get them to, to let me have some of those to sell as well because they go so well with so many different things. They're nice, they're tall, they're bold. Um, these are the guys. Um, this is you know, classic Netherlands. They've got a nice little windmill in the back. Um, they've lived on the same piece of property their entire lives in a town that, or a village, I'm sorry, that has about 1,400 people. Um, so they know everybody. And what's funny is that everybody in the peony world knows everybody in the peony world, whether they are in the Netherlands, whether they're in America. I call them the Dutch mafia, just because they are, I mean, everybody knows everybody, but they're very, they're competitive, but they're also extremely helpful. It's, it's a very interesting industry. Um, unlike being in the medical world where, you know, something doesn't happen right away, people get extremely irritated, especially doctors who want their surgeries to go on time, which I understand. Um, but what I learned from Dennis is that in the whole horticulture farming world, something always goes wrong. And that's what he's, he's told me from the beginning. Something will always go wrong. You just have to roll with it and figure out how to do it. So, <coughs> um, before I start showing you a bunch of really pretty flowers, I'm, I am going to give you a little taste just for fun. I can get this thing to work. So, these are a couple um, just inspirational photos for you. That's in my kitchen. So you know, as is that. And that's in my yard. The beauty of peonies, what I love about them, they thrive on neglect. After you get through the first few years, you really don't have to do much. I mean, they, everybody says, you know, they will outlive their garden. Um, 
or can, that is. But, you know, oh my, I'm probably messing up the video. This is an interesting one. So, okay. so this is my field. Um, this was from the first year of the first spring, and we had planted these in November. So the roots that you get, our roots are huge. I'm going to show you some pictures of that. But very first year, everything bloomed. It was delightful. We didn't, we had no plans to sell them because generally you wait until the third year to try and sell your pet flowers just because that's when they end up sort of hitting their stride. Um, they really represent what the flower is supposed to look like uh, by the third year. Ours did pretty well though, the first year, I will say. All right, so. Oh, is this not gonna let me play it? I have a little four minute video that this is from the. Uh, um, um, it's a YouTube video. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure we'll be able to play it. Uh, this is what I like about this video is that it goes through all of the process of all of the root processing and you see exactly what's involved, but, but that's not gonna happen apparently. So anyway, on this root, you can see, uh, well, first of all, with the roots, you always wanna make sure that you get nice, good sized, freshly cut roots. The time to plant peonies is in the fall. Um, you know, I see them around right now. You know, Costco's not <laughs> uh, I have purchased them <laughs> to see how they do. Um, the ones in the little baggies are these little dried out shriveled things. Don't go near them. Um, they do have some plants though right now um, that are Ichos, um, which are gorgeous and great for your garden. They're not wonderful for cut stems. Um, so let me back up a little bit then. So with the peonies, we sell basically three varieties. We've got the Lacaflora, we've got the herbaceous hybrids, and then we have the Etos, which is a combination of like a tree peony and a herbaceous peony. Three peonies are something that I would love to sell, but we are not at this point. Um, they primarily come from China and, um, or, you know, someplace else that costs a whole lot to get them here. And so they've said, no, we're not doing that. And my guys don't do them. Um, with the Etos, those have become extremely popular lately because there's been a whole lot of breeding and hybridizing of uh, new varieties. And I'm, you're looking at probably 4,000 different varieties of actual registered peonies right now with the American Peony Society. Um, so there, I mean, there's just, there's so many that, uh, I, you know, you, you could ask me about one, I may not know it. Somebody else could, you could go like 10 times and I would still not know it, but I eventually get to it. Um, this particular root is what you're looking for, okay? You want one that is a nice, big, you know, sort of carrot looking bunch. But the big thing is that you wanna see multiple eyes, right? So this has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Looking at about nine eyes that I can see. Um, this is also um, an excellent root because it's got what's called adventitious roots. Um, I'm doing this like you can see my hand. You can't see my hand at all. So over there, so you see like the long stalks that are coming down. There are, one second. <laughs> this guy right here, this guy right here, these can form eyes. So this is going to be a fruit, whatever variety this is, and I'm going to say right now I have no idea what it is because I'm just looking at the root. Um, that will become a very good producer um, in a very short period of time, which is 
what you're looking for. Um, peonies, as I've always said, is a, a marathon, not a sprint. It's for people who like to plan ahead. Um, because all of the roots are harvested in the fall, you have to wait till everything dies down in the summer. You want the ground to be starting to cool off once the, um, sorry, I messed up the situation. Um, you want the ground to be on its way down in temperature when you plant these things. Um, they want at least 40 hours of, I'm sorry, 400 hours of sub 40 degree temperatures. So peonies do much better in say Alaska than they do in Florida. In fact, I have people, I mean, my dad's got another house in Florida. I would, he would buy anything from them, but I won't let him buy it because they're just not gonna do well. And there's no point in that. Basically, I say from about Atlanta, Birmingham, Dallas latitude, peonies don't do very well below that. They really need a nice winter where they can go to sleep and store up all their little energy and these little eyes start popping out then. And then in the fall, we harvest them. Let me see what I've got in terms of pictures next. Uh, this is another one that shows the great uh, spot for adventitious roots. And then you see the little filamentous type roots. That's new growth. So with this particular root, you would want to get that in the ground or in a pot to sweet because those little suckers are very, very fragile. And you don't want them, the peonies don't like to be moved. Um, you can trick them a little bit. You know, if you've got them in a pot, keep them in the pot until November. And then just like you do any potted plant, do the whole pot in there. Don't try and like dig it out. Um, and if you are transplanting any, um, you always do it again in the fall. Make sure you give it a pretty wide berth when you're trying to dig it out and go, go deep because these things, the roots spread quickly. And if you start cutting off some of those little roots or if you cut off some of the eyes, they become unhappy with you and you know may say, I'm not gonna bloom next year, but probably will the following year. Um, Here's another one. The eyes come out, they're either like white, sometimes they're pink. Uh, that doesn't really have an effect on the color of the flower. Uh, okay. So Lorelei, I will say it's one of my favorite uh, varieties. But you can see these are just two roots that he's holding up. The size of these eyes are enormous. And they're in my field, right? It's very nice. Although we just finished our harvest, which is another reason why I'm a little flustered. I've had two 21-year-old Dutch guys, 21 and 25-year-old Dutch guys staying at my house. They're running the harvest. Oops. Horrible. So sorry, everybody does need a little Beyonce in their life. Um, so uh, we just finished the harvest. Um, these guys worked their fannies off. Um, they were in charge of getting all of the uh, H2A workers up to speed because none of them knew how to pet flowers. And there is a technique when you are going to cut your peonies. Um, well, I'll just talk about it, I guess. So what you want to do, I always use a knife instead of clippers just because it's easier and faster. Um, yeah, sorry, I went like up and down all over the place with the volume. Um, cut it with a knife and then get as many as you can hold in your hand and then you want to get it into a chiller right away. They, and you want to cut in the morning. You don't want to have, you know, the heat of the day bearing down on you when these things are being harvested because they'll just start opening up. Um, what you want to do is make sure that you find them when they are in their 
marshmallow bud phase. Um, and that's the, the rule of thumb. There are a few others that come out looking more like a rose and you wanna, so it, you sort of have to get a feel for which ones go at what time. So I've got a bunch of coral charm or coral sunset with me. Those are real pretty, nice, big, you know, coral buds. And they've got guard petals that look pretty as well. Um, and those are the perfect ones to say, okay, if they're like marshmallow, this big marshmallow feel, have them, they're great. Um, Paul and Wild is another variety that's a really pretty dark, dark red. Um, it's almost like a hot pink when it's done. Um, those, I want to say I've got some, hang on, because I just want to show you the difference. They're in the dark. Doesn't help. So I do have, um, incidentally, a whole bunch of peonies in the car. If anybody's interested in taking some out, just so you know, get that out while we can. All right. Yes. You said get them in a chiller. So you're not saying soak the stem in water once it's been cut and recut it? So it depends on what you're looking to do. Are you, if you're looking to cut uh, or to sell cut stems, then if you're harvesting from you know your farm, your house, whatever your land may be, you want to keep them dry, but immediately get them cold. Um, if you're bringing them into your house to put them Pretty bouquet. Yes, cut them always on a bias, um, you know, like every other flower. Um, put them in a little uh, warm water. I'll start opening up. And what I do to make them last a little bit longer, when they start getting to, well, they're sort of past their phase right now, but those have lasted almost two weeks. Um, and they had been in my refrigerator for a while. I mean, harvest is over, and those are some of the earlier ones. Um, but what I did, <coughs> I'm sure you've all heard of like the newspaper trick. You can wrap, wrap them in newspaper, keep the buds sort of like covered with the newspaper so it's not, you know, folding. It's, it's not folding over, it's not completely blocking the airflow, but then keep the uh, stems out, as are the, the bottoms of the stems out as well. Um, but as soon as you want them to start thinking about opening up, get them in some water, cut them, maybe cut them again later. I mean, it just depends on how fast you need it to open up. Um, but you really, these are great flowers because you really can sort of massage them a little bit and coax them to do what you want them to do. Um, and they're also quite comfortable sitting in 35 degree temperatures in, in a cooler, you know, if you are going to sell them for cut stems for about two, three weeks. Um, the roots you can keep a lot longer, um, but they have to be at freezing or below. Um, but again, roots, you really want to have the fresh ones. It just, it seems to make a big difference. Dry bucket or vertical storage? So we do, we have these big um, crates that are big metal crates that are you know, it looks like jail, <laughs> like a playpen jail is exactly what it looks like. And we put them lying horizontal on that. And then once we, so we also have a bunching machine at my warehouse. And so what we do is we harvest everything in the morning for about three hours. We have a, a cooling truck, which was really hard to get this year, by the way, <laughs> but have that out on the field. So as soon as they get, you know, one pallet in, they throw it in the truck so it immediately starts to cool down. Um, and then after about three hours and they take them all back to the main warehouse with the chiller. So, and then they can stay and they're, they're good to go for 
as long as they need. And then what they would do is about uh, two, three, four days later, uh, we would have the bunch of the machine going. Um, I'm not sure if I have a picture of that yet or not, but basically it's great because you had, so we cut, everybody wants cut stems or most people that we sell wholesale to want cut stems at 55 centimeters. And so we cut them a little bit longer and then you put them in groups of five, seven, whatever the customer wants uh, on these bunching machines and they just slide down the conveyor belt. They go through this little contraption that knows you know, exactly how uh, far you want to cut and it cuts it off at the right time. It band, binds it up with a um, little blue rubber band and then you can pack them. And we've got boxes that we pack a hundred in um, and then off they go, which is nice. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, a harvest is for the, the peonies is fast. I mean, cause you've gotta be, you gotta be quick. I mean, when all of, when they start opening, you know, Coral Sunset is usually one of the first ones to open. A lot of the reds like to open early too. Um, we had Command Performance, which was our initial one that opened this year. It had horrific frost damage. You know, we got that last late frost and they just looked wonky and they, you know, it just didn't, so those were unsellable. Um, which, you know, it was fine, but you know, it's sad because they're so pretty. So we left them on the, on the field so people driving by can still see how nice they are because from a distance, you can't tell there's a little bit of brown on it, it's fine. That's why I don't worry as much towards the end of harvest when I know we're pretty much done when it comes to things like you know, the heat, I and mean, you want to keep it hydrated, we end up um, irrigating about three times a week. Um, but we also have a slanted field. <laughs> so, you know, everything up the top gets pretty dry and then down at the bottom, they're a little wet and they don't like that as much. Um, peonies do not like having wet feet at all. Um, let me go into some of these little myths here. Uh, myth one, peonies are hard to grow. No, if I can do it, trust me. So the trick is you just gotta, you know, make sure that your land is prepped real well. Um, you know, a neutral pH, they say, you know, 6.5 to seven approximately. Um, what you really wanna make sure you do is think ahead because these suckers will grow. But then you've got to think about other things in your yard that will grow too, like trees. And so if you plant it in this wonderful spot, but then this tree all of a sudden shoots up and then puts shade all over your peony, then it's the peony's not going to be happy. It wants full sun, you know, for a good chunk of the day. Um, now, one caveat to that, and this is also one way to get them into the, the warmer climates is the etos and then put them in some like dappled sun. So you can do, I mean, my mom had Sarah Bernhardt uh, forever at her house. I was so mad I didn't dig them up after they moved, but before they moved. Um, but they, uh, I mean, they had probably two hours of really, really strong afternoon sun, but for the most part, it was just dappled morning sun. So you just gotta take into account the, the climate that you live in, right? I mean, it's, our, our hot is a lot hotter than you know, the other places. And when they say full sun for you know, eight hours, eh, we could go back to like six or five down here because it gets rough. Um, um, again, make sure you got good uh, draining soil. Uh, that's the, the biggest problem is if you leave it in like standing mud, um, that's when fungal issues start to happen. Um, fertilizer, we don't do a whole lot with fertilizer, to be honest. We use uh, uh, manure and, you know, and mixed in with compost and we use goat and cow manure. 
Uh, they don't like to use coarse manure. They say it's just not nutrient rich enough. But these are the Dutch, they're very precise. So, um, yeah. that and plant in the fall is the big, the biggest thing. The timing is key. That being said, if somebody say gets you a peony in March, get it in the ground as fast as possible. <laughs> um, they, I mean, they just always do better in the ground. Now, I experimented. You see the crate over there, um, which a lot of my roots came in. I planted two. Um, uh, Duchesse de Namur in there. There's a pretty white flower that opens up. It's a, like a saucer. It looks like a little bowl. Um, and they came up and they both bloomed. So the blooms already happened, but they're healthy. I didn't think they would be. I've been a fitting. I had these crates lying around and I was out of pots. <laughs> so you can plant them in sort of a lot of different things and they still work. Um, all right, myth number two, peonies cost too much for such a short blooming time. Well, I do think they're too short of a bloom time. That's just because I love them so much. But uh, what you do is you make sure that you make the most of it. You know, there are very, very early bloomers. There are early bloomers. There are mid to early. There are mid, I mean, all the way through very, very late. And one thing that I would suggest is looking at the American Peony Society website, and you can join that for free, um, and then you get just wealth of knowledge. Um, but they have something called the Bloom Period Date. There's the Bloom Project Date, Bloom Date Project. That's what it is. And what they do is they compare everything to the Peony Red Charm. So Red Charm which is this really beautiful, big, um, true red, enormous hybrid. And it's got these guard petals. It's, a, it's like a, a bomb. So uh, I did not tell you because it sounds like, you know, you all know peonies, but you know, you've got your singles, which are just nice little delicate uh, petals. Then you've got your semi-doubles. And then some of those will have some garden petals, some of them will have some smaller petals. Um, some of them will show the stain and then the pollen, and some will not. Then you've got your full doubles, and then you've got what we call the, the bomb um, doubles, which is thanks to the French, because it looks like a big bomb ice cream situation. And these came from Asia primarily. I mean, there are what's called species peonies, which are just naturally occurring uh, peonies that do happen in North America, Europe, Asia. Um, you never see them. Um, but uh, it was all really when the French found peonies that they became fun. Um, they really decided, let's make these suckers big and breed them so they have nice big sturdy stems. And they took off from there. And now everybody wants them. And so we, just so you know, because we're trying to extend our whole season on both ends, so we've got now uh, Peony USA here. We've got multiple fields in the Netherlands. We've got fields in Belgium. We've got fields in France. And we've just started a partnership in South Africa. So to have one on the Southern Hemisphere is going to be huge to be able to get people what they want. And this is whether it's, you know, cut stems or the roots. Um, let's see. Okay, okay. so the, the price. The range in price is crazy town. Um, we have some that So looking right now just at my price list, I mean, we have some that are $5. We have some that are $110. I've got one that's over $300. I have seen them on other sites. Um, I've seen one for $10,000. Um, 
who buys that? I have no idea, but it's people who are doing the hybridizing and, and their special breeding because they're, they're selling in the seedlings. Um, to grow a peony from seed will generally take about five years. It's a lot of work, doesn't often work out. Um, that's why your best bet is buying one that's in a potted plant or buying one that's a bare root. Um, the seed, I mean, you just, you just have to pay so much attention to it and you've got, it's just, it's a lot of work. And it's not something that I have ever been interested in. I, I think science behind the hybridizing is very cool, but I don't have the patience for that. Yes. Do they do well in pots? They do actually, as long as you keep them outside, don't bring them inside. Um, I gave a couple to a, some roots to a friend of mine and she gave one to her son and he just assumed it's a potted plant. I can put this inside. Well, it was, it was actually a digest to more and it looked like, it almost looked like an orchid. It had like this teeny tiny little uh, like stem. And I mean, it just, it was the funniest looking thing. Like, what did you do to it? <laughs> And yeah, you just get it inside. So as long as you get the pot and then let it go ahead and do its thing through summer in the pot, wait to transplant it till the fall. But I wouldn't keep it in the pot indefinitely. I mean, one or two years, sure. But um, you know, it's just they need they need their space to, to spread their their roots. Um, planting too deep is uh, one issue that a lot of people will have. You only want to plant these suckers maximum one to two inches below the surface. So those eyes that I showed you before, these need to be literally like this below the surface. You can dig underneath all you want, make it all pretty, tear it all up so it's got nice, good, aerated ground to uh, spread out in. But it needs to be up there. If you plant up too deep, you might get some foliage. You might not. It may never bloom. I mean, if I, my first year I planted some that were about six inches deep, it did nothing. And it was very discouraging. That's all I can say. Um, Okay, and so, and then again, don't just don't get discouraged because it does take sometimes three years for a peony to hit its stride. And what they always say is the first year they, what is it? First year they sleep, second year they creep, third year they leap. I don't know. Ours have been leaping the first couple of years, so that's been fun. Um, but I also put on here the American or the, um, yeah, the Pinus Society's uh, Bloom Day Project website. Um, it's very informative. What's, what's cool about it is that, so Red Charm is, uh, we'll call it plant zero. And every other variety that they have listed, which is a gazillion, will be plus two, plus three, minus two, minus one, in relation to when it blooms to red charm. So this is also based on observations of people that get sent in. So it also, what's nice about this, this thing that you get received is that it is a, uh, they tell you how many people have made the observation. And, and there was another thing on there that, that Tells you, I, I can't remember now, but the fact that say 180 people have said, you know, this blooms one day before Red Charm versus two people who say, well, the lemon chiffon blooms two I mean, You've got a lot, you've got, you know, you sort of take the information with a grain of salt. You look and see what's, you know, who's, who's in there talking. It's a whole bunch of people. 
it means a little bit more than two. Um, let's see. All right, so again, why aren't my peonies blooming? So usually it's because they're planted too deep. Yeah, I don't mean I'm not too, um, you don't agree, but uh, you don't, yeah, you don't want it too deep. You need it to be in a sunny location. You need good soil drainage. And that's pretty much the basics of it. Um, you know, people will put in when they're first planting compost, bone meal. I mean, as long as you can get the weeds gone, that's the big thing. And I am not a huge fan of that weed, um, the sheets, unless you use the really heavy stuff and put it between your peony rows. Because the grass that we get here in Virginia, it comes right up. I mean, it's practically impossible to stop unless you use some really heavy duty, you know, commercial grade stuff. And I have lists of that too as well. Um, frost, the late frost, you know, we're here in Virginia, it happens almost every year. So sadly, sometimes it affects it, sometimes it doesn't. Um, things you can do to prevent it is go out and put, you know, put a big pot over something that you've got or you know, put a, a little sheet, but then make sure you go out first thing in the morning and grab it back up, just like, you know, the other plants that you do. Um, anybody have any other questions so far? Have I, have I just sailed past some stuff? Yes. Well, can you... Grow these. Uh, I have some that um, uh, did bloom and now are, and uh, I feel like the trees have uh, covered it too much. But I have uh, a lot of other uh, flowers and uh, uh, roses mm -hmm. and also uh, irises in an area. Can, do they are they happy with other mm -hmm. plants? Oh yeah, happy? absolutely, absolutely. Can you repeat the question for the zoomers because they didn't. Oh sure, okay. So um, what was your name? Anne. Me too. Are you yeah. with an E or with no E? With an E. I am Eless. Okay. Oh. And with an E's question was, um, can you plant peonies with other flowers? relatively close by and, and have them, you know, live and you know, coexist happily together, basically. Because she's had some that were blooming fine, but then had a tree that has encroached upon it. I think I'm getting all this right. Yeah. And yeah, so it's and it's it's getting too much shade, which as we know is one of the worst things you can do. So yes, you probably gonna want to move it. And if you've got I mean, I like to plant mine with roses, with irises, with dahlias, because, you know, spring starts and you get the tulips and the daffodils, and then you get the peonies. And then if you plant it right, the peonies will lead you right into like the color of dahlia and or, I mean, iris first, I guess, then dahlias. And you really can have color from the very beginning of spring you know, until you get your summer stuff going. So they, they will live together. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of day lilies. Okay. And uh, they... Oh, they spread, they yeah. Spread. So I uh, didn't, want, didn't want to know, I wanted to know how both sides would put in, in there. Well, you can look at it like you're putting it next to another peony. Oh. Um, so, we generally keep them in when we're when we're doing them in rows and we're doing them yeah. you know with the intent of selling them you know cut stems um we keep them 30 centimeters apart so it's almost a foot um and then what we do is we, we put them in rows we elevate the rows too um that way so if it does if you do get a big rain it'll sort of off and not be 
you know, stuck all over the, the peony roots. Um, and then, uh, what was the last word I mentioned? I totally lost my train of thought there again. Um, did I answer? Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, oh, what I was going to say, I'm sorry. Yeah, so in the rows, we plant them 30 centimeters apart, and then between the rows, we do 75 centimeters, which is really narrow. Um, the problem with doing that here is that most tractors do not have wheels that are, are small enough to go in between those rows. Um, but if it's, you know, if it's your backyard, yeah. you don't have to worry about that. What do you think? Um, you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yes. What's your procedure on density if you're not cutting your peonies? If you're not cutting them. Could you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So the question was, what's the procedure for deadheading the peonies if you're not planning on cutting them? Um, we got to call it a couple and bring them inside and put them in a vase, right? But uh, what I would do is I let them do their thing and then I'll go like wait till they start looking a little funky. But the first year, you definitely want to deadhead it pretty much all of them. Um, just rip it off. Just the head. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, you can cut down if, if, if it's something where you've got sort of a bushy peony and then the, the stem is super long just for aesthetics. If you want to cut it down a little bit lower, that's fine. You just want to make sure that you keep the bulk of the foliage there so that it can be getting all the nutrients from the sun and, and all that good stuff. Yes. When you cut a peony, how far down do you leave leaves on the stand? Yes, you always want to make. Okay, the question was when you cut a peony, how far down do you cut? You always want to make sure you leave at least two different little leaf groupings. I'm sure there's a technical word that you'll know for that. I don't know what it is, but two sets of leaves. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so, and then the other thing is, especially in the beginning, we always, I don't know if this is a superstition or if it's just so we can figure out what it is later on in life, make sure they're labeled correctly. You leave one of the peony on a plant. So say you've got one that is very prolific and it gets you, you know, six blooms. Just leave one at least. So then you know what it is and you can go back. We had a bit of an incident last year um, where my beloved farmer uh, went on his tractor in uh, my new section. That's really just my showpiece section. And so it's got about 50 different varieties in there. He bushwhacked all my labels. So, yeah. So for the last several, well, last month, basically, um, while they've all been harvesting, I've been going out and trying to figure out what the heck some of these things are because. I'm not gonna lie, there are a lot of whites that look exactly the same. There are a lot of pinks that look exactly the same. There are several that are very distinct and you know it immediately. But some of these, I don't know. You know, and so I've been going by, I know how many we planted, but it's when you lose your labels, it's tough. And then you, and if you did want to sell them, you couldn't sell them with any, you know. Hi, this Hi, is this is Vicky from, from Zoom. 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 When, when, when can you when can you harvest? Esther, it's I'm sorry. Can you say that again? When can you when can you harvest? Oh, when you harvest the roots. So you harvest the roots at the end of the summer, once everything is died down, um, you basically cut back like your herbaceous, the, those will die down to the ground, cut them back all the way to the ground. Um, once they turn brown and nasty looking, um, get rid of all of that 
stuff. We don't want to keep any of the, the dead leaves and, and roots and or um, not stems and you know, old flowers around. It just it breeds, you know, it, it just, it's the breeding ground for a, a, some sort of fungus or some insect coming to, to chew on them. Um, so what we do is we harvest in at the end of the summer. And then it takes a good solid two to three weeks to do the root processing. Um, I wish I had this video. Um, Y'all should go on my uh, Dutch partner's website. Well, actually, I've got it on my website too, but it's the bottom, you kind of have to find it. But um, Molinar Agriculture uh, dot NL. Wait, what? Right, yes. And uh, there's a whole video, it's only four minutes, but it tells you exactly what they do. And it's a very um, eco friendly company, they really do try to, to, to minimize pesticides and, and various things like that. So, um, they use like, lots of like, rinses. I mean, so just to give you an idea what happens, they harvest them out in the fields they have a big machine that's like a um assembly line sort of machine that that takes the roots that they're harvesting and it bounces them around to get off most of the loose soil then they come in and they immediately go into a hot water bath then they go through their first set of cleaning and Basically, so it goes to the people who are going to be doing the cutting, but they're having to pull out the weeds. And I mean, because there's still going to be weeds and grass and stuff when you're digging that far down. Then after they do their initial thing, it goes through a second cleaning and it goes to these blue lights that wipe out like 98% of any uh, bacteria or fungus. Um, and then it goes into this, I mean, it's a whole process. And then it goes into this a cold chiller um, that cools it down really, really fast. And then it comes out and it gets uh, counted and packaged. And it, there's a, another step or two in there that uh, I was fortunate enough to see. I actually went to the Netherlands last year for two weeks to be able to help with the processing of the roots, which was fascinating. Um, unbelievably labor intensive um, and they do everything by hand, which, you know, if you're doing it in your garden, you want to, <laughs> you're going to be doing everything by hand, but it's, it's not difficult. Um, you just want to make sure if you are going to divide your own, keep it so that you've got a minimum of three to five eyes. Um, just, it's just, you're just going to have so much better luck getting uh, blooms your first year if you've got a nice good size healthy root. Uh, am I getting the hook? Time leave for maybe one or two more questions. Oh yeah. Oops, what am I doing? Oh yeah. Last thing, you don't need to answer for peonies. Peonies tolerate the ants just fine. They don't hurt them, but ants do love the, the honey nectar that is on there but uh everybody's like oh, what do you do with the ants just shake them off you can do a little rinse put a little you know bounty towel right over it immediately afterwards so it dries out but um they won't hurt it so what questions yes so where did peonies come from to begin with and how has it evolved to all the all these little steps that you do well so it started over in like china and uh, in Japan, and yeah, you know, they use them for medicinal purposes. They've got all sorts of, you know, healing properties. Um, in fact, actually, one of the things that I have here today um, was donated by one of my customers, who is a. Uh, well, hold on, I'll get back to that. Went from Asia to France, and the French were really the ones who who made them popular, and. And then they took off in Europe, and everybody wanted to have the French type. Um, you know, lactoflora is primarily what they have. Um, like Sarah Bernhardt, you know, the classic pink peony smells amazing. 
what's wonderful is that that's one of the least expensive ones that we have. And it's not because it's less than at all. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic peony. It's just not new and shiny, right? So that's that's what drives the price up on these, these peonies is that, you know, everybody wants the new, rare situation. So for instance, we've got, we've got a uh, one called Sunny Girl and we have one called Sunny Boy. Sunny Girl, well, Uh, uh, Sunny Girl is 1747 a stem. Sunny Boy is $303.65 a stem. Yeah. And it's just, Sunny Boy is a big double, which is rare with the yellows. Yeah, we have, there are a lot of uh, Itos that are yellow, which, you know, make nice big flowers, but they're really much better for garden flowers. They're not great for cutting. Um, but like Callie's memory, uh, you know, I don't know how much, I, I wanted to be able to show you guys more pictures, but, um, but um, anyway, they, uh, uh, I I don't know. I mean, I, honestly, because it's been out for a few years now, so I would think the price would start coming down on Sunny Boy. But it is just a much better flower. It smells better than Sunny Girl. It looks better. I mean, it's, but how they did it, I don't know. And then there's Lemon Chiffon, which is, I mean, cheap as dirt compared to all of this. Uh, well, that was 2222. But that's another one that I wanted to show you because. It's one that can scare you when you don't know what the bulb looks like. Frequently, it will look like when it's just about to open. It's it's yellow on the outside, and the inside looks like it's it's almost like a little intestines or brain. It's like all you know in there. Um, but then when it opens, it's all beautiful and pretty and yellow. It's just if you see that for the first time and it's the first time you've ever had lemon fun, you're like, oh gosh, this is going to look horrible. But no. It's funny, the, the, the buds can look completely different from what you would expect with the blooms. There are a lot that start off as a, like a blush and then go totally bright white. Um, there are a lot of white ones that, if there's any insect in it at all, and this happens with the pink as well, um, they'll get like little, those little veins, little, which just gives it a little extra something, something, but a little like hot pink to red veins through it. Um, but going back to the question, China to France. And then when the Americans got all of it, they realized, hey, we need some new colors. Red, pink, white. That's all we got. That's all anybody was doing. And so you have people like Samuel Wissing, who came up with all the corals, coral charm, coral sunset, coral magic. Um, and that was back in the 40s or 50s, I believe. Um, could be 60s. There are a lot of varieties out there, people. <laughs> um, but they started trying to do some breeding that gave people new and interesting colors. Uh, the, like the Itos, you've got lots of purples, you've got yellows, you've got, you know, like peachy, peachy colors. Um, one of my all-time favorites is one called Pastel um, which, you know, it's $110 per root on sale with us, but that just won, uh, like, the gold medal of honor at the um, American Peony uh, Convention, which is actually happening, it started today. I decided to come here and be with you guys and not go to Michigan. Yeah, I know. And I know you'll have to go, but one last thing. One thing you do have to worry about towards the end of the bloom time is be on the lookout for insects. Um, if you see a whole lot of, I said butterflies, I didn't mean butterflies, ladybugs, that means you basically have an aphid infestation. So if you see more than say 10 ladybugs in about a you know, 
10 foot square or 10 foot uh, radius, you've got an infestation of aphids. And so they won't necessarily hurt the flower, but they, I mean, it won't hurt it long term. But for that year, you'll get some little brown spots, so they'll eat some of the leaves. It eats, the aphids actually eat the larva and eggs of the, um, what did I just say? The larvas eat the larva or the eggs of the aphids. And then the other thing to watch out for are thrips, which these teeny tiny little suckers that, you know, once, you just you just have to always be on the lookout because once they got them, they will also turn the leaves brown. They'll you know put holes in them. And, you know they just they make they make them very unhappy. And then the fungus that you have to worry about is botrytis and the white powdery mildew for the most part. All of these things are easy to get rid of. It's just a matter of being vigilant and you know putting the, the right you know insecticide or fungicide or whatever on it. Any other questions? Question. Yeah. Uh, you said twice that the beetles are not good for cutters because the stem is so short. It's just because the stem is short. Okay. Um, they often do not have any sort of a smell either, which uh, you know, usually when people want a bouquet of flowers, they want to have the pretty. Um, so how long is the stem? Well, there are some that get to be nice and long, but they're fewer and farther between. I mean, they're usually much, much closer to the ground. Um, they're prolific, which is nice. And so it's, that's why it's really a great landscaping flower. I mean, you could sort of put it, you know, along in the front, right? And then put, say, you know, irises in the back or azaleas or you know, whatever you've got going on uh, that's a little bit taller. Um, 